Okay, we're back with our formerly expensive. Now we're bought for cheap, but still expensive formerly to maintain. Expensive. So I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what's the category on these other than absurdity. This is part of our big sedan challenge, but it's different for us because we're going to do something we don't normally do. We're not going to bother to even drive them. This is all the stuff that we have to live with. Yes. It's the things that are broken. It's uh -huh. the things that are the personality. It gives the car personality or character. So welcome to our anxiety. She's beautiful. The styling has really grown on me. And now I really love the Quattroporte's blend of size and elegance compared to how small it drives. At this point in my Quattroporte ownership, my anxiety remains really high despite the good handling. Oh, there's lots to be concerned about. To begin, it's the noises that tell the story of this car. The first thing you want to hear upon opening the driver's door is the comforting sound of the F1 transmission pump. This sound tells you the car has a chance of starting and running. And I really hope she starts. It's that really scary noise every time I start this car. Here we go. If the car explodes for some reason, well, this footage will never be found. Yep, that's the seatbelt warning. Here we go. Listen to that. Cam variator. Okay, so you see the check engine light? It stays on for 18 seconds while the car goes through all of its startup procedures, make sure nothing's wrong. I always hope the check engine light goes out. Once she starts, it idles out into really smooth, nice music. But it's just that cam variator start. At, at the very beginning, it means there's no oil up in the cam variators. And the only solution is an $8,000 fix where you have to replace solenoids and have the front machined, and then you should be fine. Here's the cold start with the hood open. See that cam variator ticking sound goes away once the dry sump begins throwing oil everywhere. All you hear now is the valves. I was kind of hoping the engine would rock on its mounts a little bit on startup, but they appear to be collapsed. Awesome. All of the outside door handles have redundant switches. The first is a black mechanical lever hidden near the back. The second is the electric button that most easily falls to your fingers. That's the one that gets used the most. When you touch it, the solenoids kick the door open. But it's that expensive slam that is still better than most luxury cars today. Yes, I judge a car by its door slam. You know I had to go there. Ah, solid engineering. The rear door slam is even tighter. So solid and chunky. Here it is from the inside. Makes y'all warm and fuzzy, doesn't it? Of course, I now have to compare the QP5 to the Cayman GTS door slam. You know, the gold standard. And again from the inside. Even when you're in sport mode, there's lots of delay while the robot declutches and then engages each next gear. Lots of owners have recommended that you shift the car yourself because the car's transmission electronics were never good enough to figure out what you wanted. Column mounted clickety click shifts. Very satisfying. And for the finale, I'm starting out in third gear with a slow roll and taking it up to almost redline. I say almost because the car started to slow down and hesitate just before the actual red line of 7500 and it wouldn't let me go further even in sport mode. No warning lights anywhere, you see the water temperature is right on par, it's perfect. On the very bright side, I'm just happy the engine didn't grenade itself and the car still runs. Small victories, you know. Alright, one more pull. I can hear three cam stages, listen. Oh yes, I forgot to mention, the clock thinks it knows better than you do, and it won't let you set the minutes accurately. It's a little fast. See, I can only have 29 or 59. If you can stomach all of this, Maserati QP5 ownership is for you. Otherwise, run far away.
But then, of course, you park and you look back at her again. Bellissima. Maserati. The Phaeton is an all-wheel drive, 5,200-pound, do-anything, all-weather monster. And when I had a blizzard that completely covered my driveway, I had a terrible idea. My driveway is impassable right now. So I'm going to try to break through it with a Phaeton, which is bound to end in disaster. I do have it in the full lift mode, though. <laughs> oh God. And now it says uh, fault, running gear workshop. Good news, good news. It gave a valiant effort, but most things would not have made it out. Luckily, our Cayenne was around and able to rescue the Phaeton. And once I got the packed snow out of the undercarriage, it reset itself, thankfully. Otherwise, this has been my favorite winter car ever. Heated and cooled massage seats with 18-way adjustment are my new winter requirement. This became our perfect ski car with tons of room and, of course, its theatrical mechanized trunk. Any review of this car mentions the trunk hinges because of their elaborate design, and also because the rest of the car is so very bland. Of course, there is an internal trunk release button next to the fuel filler release. It worked when I got the car and now simply refuses, so I'm terrified that the fuel filler button will also stop working. At this point, the only remote way to open the trunk is to turn the car off and use the fob. You press the button once and wait a few seconds for it to open. Don't hold it down or press it again. Then it thinks you want it closed and just sits there. Luckily, if all else fails, there is a keyhole. It's hidden in the bottom of the logo. The Phaeton has also done work as a dog hauler. I borrowed the Covercraft seat cover from my wife's Cayenne. They were not impressed. Right after I got the car, the wipers needed to be changed. And I tried many different shapes and sizes that claimed to work, and none of them did, as the Phaeton has a unique low-profile connection. You have two options. You can either buy brand new blades on their frame for $50 each, or you can buy just the rubber blade itself for $12. This means you're now dismantling your wiper and putting on the new rubber blade. Of course, they're expecting that you would take this to your dealer and spend the money, just another bespoke surprise from our friend, the Phaeton. Also notice that the wipers have individual motors, one per blade. The Phaeton does have a hidden flashlight in the center console. It's designed to look like the other knobs on the console. I do have it, and it's very cool, but it does not work. There's absolutely no Bluetooth in here, and you can't change the head unit as it's the brains of the entire car. So I bought a cheap Bluetooth FM adapter, which works well enough. You can remove the six disc changer and plug in a Bluetooth adapter, but that terrifies me because every button on the console that relates to the changer likes to get stuck. It sticks itself down and then locks out the entire rest of the system. Speaking of buttons, all the buttons on the roof are that great early 2000s soft touch rubber so they've bubbled beyond recognition. I press and just guess what will happen while waiting for more paint to flake away. Then one night this winter while driving along, car suddenly freaked out, huge buzzer, flat tire warning. I go to the vehicle settings to see what are the tire pressures actually showing. It shows all four tires have gone off the map completely. And when I go outside and look at the car, it's fine. It turns out one of the four tires was down two PSI. The car's conclusion, defective wheel on board. My recurring issue with this car has been coolant leaks, a fairly common problem with these. The first one was between the engine and the heater core, which would take 16 hours of labor to replace a $20 part. I put leak stop in and kept driving it. Then another leak appeared two months later. This one required 22 hours of engine out labor. I laughed and promptly bought another bottle of leak stop. Seems like a worthy fix for a $5,000 car. I've driven this 2004 Volkswagen Phaeton nearly 5,000 miles since I got it. To my amazement, it remains the best thing I've ever driven for a straight highway cruise. Too bad about the maintenance and the gas mileage. That's all for now, but there's still lots of driving adventures to come with these cars, including some autocross and probably even a long road trip. Let us know what you'd like to see. Since 2007, Everyday Driver has been finding great cars and experiences for real people. Now we're delivering more content to more places than ever before. 
Our TV show premieres on the Motor Trend Cable Channel and can also be found on Amazon Prime. Plus, older episodes are available worldwide on Pluto TV and Vimeo. Our top 10 podcast, The Car Debate, takes your questions and helps you find the perfect car. The whole garages and even a few marriages have improved over 500 episodes, with new ones dropping every Tuesday and Friday. On YouTube, we cover cars of all kinds, from exotics to haulers and even hybrids. While Nate reviews motorcycles. Plus, we've got five feature films, including unique retrospectives of the 911, the M3, and the Corvette. And if that's not enough, we host meetups, live podcasts, and even driving trips to Europe. So thanks for watching, listening, and supporting what we do.